you very much indeed for the introduction and for the invitation to join with you today uh, to present a little bit about uh, the European Union and some of the activities that we are undertaking there and how they over time will frame the market and the, the location and attractiveness of geothermal energy within that context. Um, I'm sure you, you are aware that uh, early last year uh, we came out with uh, a strategy, a new strategy for energy in the European Union. We called it the Energy Union uh, Strategy. And it was an opportunity to put in one document an overarching view of where we are on energy and energy policy and energy trends within the European Union. And to set out within the document where it is we wanted to be in the context of energy in the European Union going forward. And it is built on five dimensions, but perhaps before I illustrate what the dimensions deal with, it's perhaps important just to, to say what isn't so evident in the, the dimensions, and that is why did we do it and what are the really very highlight issues that have uh, resulted from this. We did it because in Europe we're going through an energy transition and the U Energy Union strategy did a number of things. Firstly, it moved us away from a focus in terms of our policy on the supply side of energy and moved us more into the space of looking at the demand for energy and the services that we get from energy. And that means it has a much greater focus on the energy market. And when you look at an energy market, or indeed any market, you do, by nature, have to look at the consumers in that market. And as a consequence, the energy union strategy puts the energy consumer at the center of the strategy. And that was the first time in any of our policy papers that the energy consumer took center stage in our policies. And of course, as you will appreciate, that does shift the emphasis to some extent uh, in what we do in our policy context. The second aspect that the union strategy did was that it very clearly and made visible in a somewhat analytical way the fact that for the European Union, we cannot afford to have energy policy decided within 28 boxes. It is too expensive for consumers and for our economy. It is much more efficient and much more cost effective if the 28 work together as a pan-European energy market and deliver that to the economy and to the consumer. In the end of the day, we are visionaries but also realness, realists in the European Commission. So we do realize that moving from 28 boxes to a pan-European energy market in one go might be a little bit difficult. So the pathway we have laid out in the Energy Union strategy is one of regionalization. Regional cooperation amongst member states in appropriate uh, conformities and structures to the issue that is at stake. So the regional cooperation that you might have, for example, for electricity, might not be the same geographic structure that you would have for gas. But each region would find its own appropriate structure to resolve the problems. But the key issue is that we move away from energy being dealt with entirely within 28 boxes to energy being dealt with at a pan-European way through regional cooperation. So in that context, the energy union strategy stretched the policy to the level of the consumer and to the level of a pan-European uh, approach to energy. And within it, we have, as I say, the five, the five dimensions. The key dimensions, of course, come from very obvious challenges that we have for energy. Energy security in the European Union is a big issue. We import almost 60% of our energy. Uh, historically, three years ago, that cost us 400 billion euros a year, more than a billion euros a day. Ironically, today, it costs us 285, <laughs> which is very good news. But the, the key message out of this is, frankly, we didn't do anything to bring that bill down. So as a consequence, we don't know what we would need to do to stop it going back up again. 
So our vulnerability on the cost of the energy is very real and is linked to the aspect of such a high level of importation. Secondly, we have seven of our member states who have a single supplier for gas through a single pipeline. So vulnerability in a cold winter's evening of the pipeline being turned off is very real if your heating is depending on that. And of course, we have a real issue as a consequence of energy policy having been dealt with in 28 boxes in that we don't have enough physical interconnections between the member states to bring gas from A to B or to bring the electricity electrons from X to Y in order to share it across the member states. So this is a real issue that we have with regard to security of supply and we have challenges and opportunities to deal with there. As I say, we're looking at energy as a market, the consumer in the market. Have we achieved a real integrated internal energy market? Well, we don't really think so. I already mentioned the question of uh, infrastructure, and you can see here where we are today and where we would like to be by 2020. It's not so far away. It's quite achievable and it's quite close. And out of this, we can deliver cost reductions to the European economy and to the European consumer. And this is an aspect that we watch on a constant basis in terms of our cost and pricing uh, analysis that we do. What the Energy Union did was it established the principle of energy efficiency first. When you import 400 billion euros worth of energy, it's not an outrageous concept to say we want energy efficiency first. It is the first fuel for the Energy Union. And we have a whole series of activities uh, within the European Union in the area of energy efficiency. And indeed, I have to say, with some content, that the policies are working. In 2006, we succeeded in decoupling GDP growth from energy consumption. And this is a trend that has been maintained since then, and certainly one that we would envisage continuing as we go forward. As you know, the European Union has a target of decarbonizing its economy between 80 and 95% by 2050. This is our decarbonization roadmap. And we are moving down that direction in a measured and in a milestone way. We already have our targets for 2020, and in many respects we are on track. We've already exceeded our greenhouse gas emission targets. We are on track for the renewables, and with another little effort we'll get there for energy efficiency. And we are now moving forward to our objectives for 2030. And here we're doubling the target for greenhouse gas emissions. We're increasing the level of uh, target for renewables. We are focusing also on decarbonization of transport and looking at what are tools and techniques that we can uh, use in that space. And I'll explain some of those in a moment. And the fifth pillar, which unfortunately too often gets forgotten when you have a very large policy document is the whole issue of research and innovation. It is key to the energy transition that we are in at the moment. It has allowed us to start this journey because it has developed the new technologies from renewable energies that we didn't have available previously and now we have them. Of course, we're not finished. We need to have further cost reductions. We need to have further efficiencies. We need to further integrate the new technologies into our system so that they can deliver services to consumers. And we have new ideas that will be needed and that will be developed and that will enter into the market. So it is an ongoing activity in the research and innovation space uh, for our challenge. So the Energy Union, as I say, set out this broad vision built on five dimensions and within it, established an action plan of 15 areas that we'd we would work on. And like a lot of politicians who have a term of office, our college wanted it all done now, preferably yesterday. So 2016 is the year of delivery of most of these actions in the Energy Union strategy. It means that this year we are coming forward with a series of initiatives that will amend nearly all of the legislation, the European legislation for energy in the European Union. We've already brought forward a security of supply package for gas. 
Um, we al already have a strategy on LNG. We've brought forward a strategy on heating and cooling. And we have a legislative propo proposal on intergovernmental agreements. In the summer, we will bring forward the energy, the effort sharing decision for greenhouse gas emissions, the Lulu CF, which is on the agricultural side, and the communication and decarbonisation of transport. In September, we will bring forward our package on energy efficiency, which is uh, the level of ambition for energy efficiency for 2030, the measures that will be necessary for it, and an updating of the energy performance of buildings directive. And at the end of this year, we come forward with what we call the market design package, which is a revision of the electricity directive, a revision of the renewable energy directive, a revision of the governance procedures, ENSOE and ACER, and a proposal on the governance mechanism for the energy and climate package for 2030. So it is enormous. Yeah. In the European Union, when we bring forward legislation, we firstly have to do an evaluation of everything. And that's on average 250 pages per text. And then we do an impact assessment on everything, and that's about 500 pages per text. And then we bring forward the proposal. So at the moment, I can tell you my office is about here in terms of an evaluations and impact assessments and numbers of preparation of the legislation of this package coming through. It's a serious challenge, but it's also a real opportunity because the fact that we are opening all of these documents, these legislations, at the same time forces us to start interacting with other colleagues and saying, mm, you're looking at the market design and you want something on demand response. Well, you know, one of the deliveries on demand response will be our buildings, which we should no longer consider as inert, inert objects that are sinks for energy, but rather buildings are virtual powerhouses. They produce energy, they use energy, they manage energy. And in collectivity, they are supporters, supporters of the new energy system. So sh shouldn't we think about linking something from the energy performance of buildings and the electricity market design? When we look at transport and some of the trends and directions going forward, and you say, mm, yes, we're looking at you know, electrification of vehicles and maybe they're coming on stream. We already have provisions for the rollout of public electricity charging points. Why don't we have them in every building? We put it in the buildings directive. So this kind of linked up thinking across the initiatives is happening. And I hope out of it that you will see that we'll have a much stronger set of proposals that are interlinked and looking at how each of the component parts can re mutually reinforce each other and deliver a, a better and more effective system. Maybe to go through some of the specifics that are particularly relevant to today's audience. The new market design. This is a revision of the uh, electricity market in the European Union to answer the question. Should renewables fit the electricity market? Or should the electricity market fit renewables? And we're going down the route of the latter. And that means that the electricity market has to change. It means it has to become much more flexible than it is today. It means that our gate closure times, our interday trading, our balancing services all need to be readjusted to reflect the new structure of generation within the electricity market, and also to reflect the new possibilities that are available to us through smart and intelligent use of both the, the infrastructure at distribution level, but also at consumption level. And this will allow renewables, shall we say, to become a grown-up industry, no longer the baby in the corner that has very, very special treatment, but allowing renewables to gradually take their place in the marketplace, their roles, their responsibilities, but also to bring their benefits to the marketplace in a market way. That's just a little graphic. Um, we will support this, of course, with uh, the developments that we're doing on the research side. Because for us, the research emphasis within the European Union has to adjust in order to respond to the changes in our energy system. And probably the most visible element of that is the fact that having spent very successfully years developing technologies within 
technology silos. Our research historically, our set plan focused on wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, whatever. Now we're saying that's not actually what we need to do. Now we have to say, okay, we have a system. They all have to work together. They have to mesh together so that the system is effic effe effective, so that the system functions, and so that the system is reliable going forward in the most cost-effective way. And in that context, we have readjusted our energy, our research uh, space into 10 priorities, focusing on this integration of renewables into the energy system, both at the supply side and at the consumption side. Within that space, of course, we are looking at geothermal. It is one, we spend almost 40% of our research budget on renewables technologies. We have an element of competition between the technologies, but we also have framed conditions for individual technologies to bring them forward. For the European Union, geothermal energy clearly delivers two very important services. Firstly, it delivers into our heating and cooling system. We have district heating systems in Europe. About 12% of our heating uh, is in a market environment through district heating. Overall, heating and cooling uh, consumes more than half of our total final energy. But we have this, this developed system in place already in many parts of Europe. We have about 150,000 kilometers of district heating networks in the European Union and geothermal Delivering heat and energy into that system is a perfect opportunity for us in Europe. And it's one that has happened, but can happen more. That's absolutely true. And our research is looking at what are the obstacles, be they practical, be they financial, and what are the opportunities for cost reduction in terms of delivering greater service into those networks. And I don't have to tell you this, you, you've seen this before, we have geothermal possibilities pretty much across Europe in terms of the heating space, and we have a market opportunity. Uh, this year was the first time that we came out with a heating and cooling strategy where we looked at the situation for heating and cooling in Europe. And you can see here what kind of sources of energy we're currently using. And from it, it is clear that if we are to achieve our decarbonizing objective by 2050, we have to firstly decarbonize our energy system, our, our power system. We have to decarbonize our buildings. And we have to decarbonize to the level of 60% our transport system. So this chart, which I show you now, cannot stay in place if we are to achieve our energy decarbonization and our heating and cooling decarbonization by 2050. Uh, as I say, we see district heating systems and renewable energy feeding into the district heating system as a real opportunity. And it is interesting to see that a number of member states who perhaps might not have been intuitive, if I take the UK as an example, are adopting district heating systems as their heating strategy going forward. Of course, geothermal also delivers electricity. We have within our 2020 target of 20%, uh, geothermal identified as a specific technology delivering both heat but also electricity. This is where we are. It's a bit slow, I would say. It's smaller, except perhaps Italy is there, and Iceland, of course. But it's a bit slower, as you can see, within the European Union. And much of this is down to a lot of the barriers that you already mentioned. Lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, administrative procedures, some elements of cost as well. So some elements of the size of the industry and its position to make it visible. So going forward, what, what do we want to do? We want to continue our investment in all of the transition technologies for energy going forward. We have a number of financial instruments which we currently operate. We will continue to use these instruments to deliver on the energy transition in the European Union. And I'm looking forward, as I say, to uh, the end of 2016, when we will have delivered uh, the legislative proposals of the Energy Union. 
and they are coming into effect in advance of 2020, so that we will be able to take the next leap forward in decarbonisation of the energy system in the European Union by 2050. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.